Hello everyone and welcome to the annual meeting of the Global Future Councils um, 2019 uh, where um, uh, and this particular issue briefing which is on preserving the planet's biodiversity. Um, the session is filmed and webcast live. Uh, it's an issue briefing so we'll be talking for about 30 minutes to get some insights from our, from our panellists, really looking at how, how we can preserve the planet's biodiversity, given that there are a million species at risk of extinction, according to the United Nations. So how can we avert a sixth mass extinction? Now, the panellists I have today, on my immediate left, I have, um, I have uh, Caroline Anstey. Um, I, um, uh, I also have um, uh, uh, Thomas Emma Cora. I have Diane Banino Holdorf, and I have Carlos Manuel Rod Rodriguez Echandi, who's the Minister of Environment uh, and Energy of Costa Rica. Sorry, if I just give everyone's titles again. So Caroline Anstey, who's with the Inter-American Inter Development Bank. Um, Diane Banino um, Holdorf, who's a Managing Director um, for Food and Nature at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, uh, and then Carlos Rodriguez um, uh, Echandi, who's the Minister of Environment of, of Costa Rica. Um, I'm going to put the same question to um, everyone on the panel. Um, why do we need to preserve the planet's biodiversity? Why is it important? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Coming from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, I'll bring the multi-stakeholder lens to answering the question, but really from the lens of business. I think as business has recognized the urgency and risks and opportunities associated with climate change, the same is true with preserving nature. And in fact, part of what the opportunity here is, is to make sure we're not talking about these as siloed agendas. They're really very much linked. Whereas within climate, we've seen the linking of reporting through the Task Force for Climate Related Disclosures, where we're capturing the costs, risks, and materiality of climate. We are starting to do the same for nature. One of the things that we've done within the World Business Council for Sustainable Development is in partnership with groups like the World Economic Forum, WWF, We Mean Business and Others, is to create a platform called Business for Nature, which is one of the areas where we'll be able to bring together the voice of business, both on the solutions and actions that are being taken, but also on the policy asks, what's the enabling environment that creates action consistently across business to really be able to take action on preserving, conserving, and sustainably managing nature and biodiversity? I'll pause there and bring in some more examples as we go. Um, Caroline. I think I would reiterate that. I mean, we're human beings. We live in societies. Societies and human beings are an integral part of nature. You take away nature. You begin to take away um, the air we breathe. You take away what we eat. You take away what we drink. I, I simply don't think that we can exist without a robust natural system around us. The problem now is we don't price in that natural system. So we have an economy that essentially rewards short-term investing, which may be antithetical to nature, and doesn't reward long-term sustainable um, upholding and boosting of nature. And I'll come to, on to that later. I think that uh, we need to protect it because it's a moral imperative, uh, as simple as that. Uh, and, uh, yeah, of course, nature underpins uh, human well-being, underpins our, our economy. And what is happening with uh, nature is going to happen with us humans. Uh, we're, this is not just losing one million or so of a species. Our consumption and production patterns is affecting the life-supporting system of the planet, as serious as that. It's not separate to us. No, it? no, at all. And the problem is that we humans, we believe that we are far from nature. Yeah, we, we are the dominant species, but we are part of nature. Uh, this planet has uh, seen bigger and stronger species throughout uh, his history. They have come and, come and gone. Uh, that may be the case with humans if we don't react immediately to what is happening. This is very serious. Uh, 
So it's not just uh, that we're changing the climate, or it's not just that uh, we're polluting the environment or losing species. We are affecting the life supporting system of the planet. So life in the future may not be similar to what we know today if we continue this unsustainable consumption and production pattern. Thomas. So I'm going to walk in the same direction here, um, which is that it's a binary choice, really. Do we want to continue as humans to live on Earth, um, or do we not? I think it's, uh, uh, we, we've estimated that there is possibly a greater threat to human life within the century as both world wars combined, just through climate change. So it, it, it's, it's more of a question of life or death than I think just biodiversity. And we should be the most concerned about ourselves. And the best way to preserve ourselves is to buy help the planet be its best regenerative, um, at its best regenerative capacity. And there are many, so as a futurist and having worked with the X Prize and um, MIT and uh, different organizations, the G7, thinking about these kinds of questions, I think that you know the, the, the shortest uh, path to success is to see ourselves as the threatened species more than the rest of the others. We're the threatened species. So as a, uh, I mean, given that all of us on this panel are, are, are threatened species, but, um, I mean, what does it say? I mean, um, why, do we, why do we even need to make a business case for this? One of the challenges is that, as many of us have said, is we haven't really put a cost to nature. And so while businesses increasingly recognize that their future, as ours as humans does, depends on the availability of the natural resources upon which the business models depend, we have to get to a consistent way of pricing those, and we have to be able to recognize those who are doing well with improved costs of uh, capital or improved recognition in stock price, while also creating equitable risks for companies who are not managing those costs well. That's really a, an important part of this challenge. And do you see companies are doing that? We do have companies who are starting to improve the transparency of the reporting, the transparency of their sourcing, starting to build in those externalities of both environmental and social risk of their supply chain into their internal cost basis. What we don't yet have is a consistent mechanism for looking at that pricing across sectors in the same com uh, companies in the same sector, to be able to really recognize and reward and challenge those who are and are not doing it well. So there are companies who very much are responding to the challenge. We need to put the frameworks in place that will enable us to do that very consistently across businesses and sectors, particularly those sectors that are most at risk, like those in food and land use, seafoods, extractives, et cetera. I mean, Caroline, you, you work in the, in, um, your career has been in, in international organizations. Are you seeing this happening? I'm seeing it happening, but what we have now is we have islands of best practice in an enormous ocean of mispricing. So we still have governments that are subsidizing fossil fuels, making fossil fuels cheaper than they need to be. We have governments that are uh, how, supporting... How, how, are they sort of, how are they making them Because cheaper? they're putting money into the fossil fuel industry. Uh, the same with unsustainable fisheries. The same with unsustainable agriculture. This is public money that's it's going into... It's public money or it's incentives. And um, as was just said, we need carrots, but we need sticks as well. We need to make it clear that it's no longer the case that if you want to have a green investment, you almost have to pay more. And a brown, a dirty, a dirty investment will be cheaper because, and the way we do that is to price in what are called the externalities. So if you build a bridge and to do it, you have to chop down a huge swath of forest, that, the cost of that forest to the economy or to the locality has to be priced into the price of the bridge. So we level the playing field. Similarly, we need to know from companies their entire supply chain, and we need global metrics. At the moment, companies are sometimes integrating environment and social into their programs, but there are no global metrics, and there are no global standards or regulation. And without that, consumers don't know. I believe 
that today many consumers will make the choice to buy the green product, to invest in the sustainable investment, but they just simply don't know the difference because we don't have transparency in accounting or in labelling, and we need that. Consumers and maybe even perhaps citizens. I, mean, I, I want to bring in, um, I want to bring in uh, Carlos Manuel because, anyways, your government has been held up as being um, uh, extremely progressive in its uh, in, in its environmental policies. I mean, how, how have you sort of actually tackled these these challenges within your country? Well, first let me say that uh, let me give you a reality check. 50% of the nations of this world doesn't have a rule of law. There is no transparency. There is no good governance. There is no respect to human rights. There is no independent courts. There is no free press. There is no private property. There is not many things. And how are these tied many, to the environment? Many, many very important enabling conditions. Unless we come to realize that we need to heavily invest in the transition towards the good governance models, we will be bulldozer, bulldozed by climate change and the loss of biodiversity. Uh, climate change, I'm very concerned that, you know, there's a lot of um, civil unrest because of what I just mentioned. And climate change will just basically add more fuel to that uh, social unrest. And this is just going to dramatically increase in the next one to two years. It's not just the well-educated kids from the north that are doing strikes because of climate change. It's way more serious than that, and it's gonna happen heavily in those uh, countries that are trapped, within this social environment trap, whereby the lack of governance will uh, be kind of the detonator of our conflicts. And, and, and that is a reality. In, in my case, I come from a country that uh, when my grandfather was born in 1898, Costa Rica was probably the, uh, the, more, the, the less developed uh, nation in the Western Hemisphere. And today, Costa Rica lives uh, longer than the average American, lives happier than any American with a smaller, way, way smaller environmental footprint. And that has been basically because my country has been investing in all those items I just mentioned before. And I can, you know, add one more for, which has been key to us, that was when we abolished the army. 70 years ago, we abolished the army in Costa Rica. We heavily invested in education and healthcare. And all of a sudden, you know, people come to realize that uh, nature is part of our development agenda. Costa Rica has been able to go 100% renewable energies, has doubled the size of our forests, at the same time that our economy tripled, and, and the population. You, have you brought citizens along with that? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, in, in, in Costa Rica, uh, it makes economic sense to protect nature. As a matter of fact, we have uh, a decarbonization plan that aims to be zero emission by 2050, where we plan to be 60% forest cover in Costa Rica. Today we are 52, and we've been restoring uh, degraded lands, coming, bringing nature once more, and that is becoming, giving us a high possibility to be more climate resilient in, in water, particularly in, in the water sector, in the energy sectors. Uh, but at the same time, we've been able to create national mechanisms where protecting nature makes a lot of sense. Every, we got a, by the way, we got a carbon tax in Costa Rica. It is not like the northern concept where you put a tax so people will be more efficient in how they use fossil fuels. No, in Costa Rica, we got what I call a tropical carbon tax where it deals with the market failure uh, uh, of the positive externality. So those who are providing a carbon fixation service by keeping forests and planting trees are fully compensated for that carbon offset by those who consume fossil fuels. We, got, we have created a very positive incentive for nature conservation. If, if the payment for carbon that matches the cost of opportunity of doing the wrong irrational agricultural livestock activities we want to avoid. People will protect forests. 
Uh, and this is what we have done in Costa Rica. It makes a lot of economic sense. So the good governance, the dealing with the market failures, which was very well mentioned by Diane here, are two of the things that has really worked very well in Costa Rica. Um, Diane, in terms of those, um, you know, redressing, I guess, those, those, those market failures, but can, you see, can you see an appetite from business uh, to do this? If we can get this right, we can actually flip economies and we can create incentives, much like what Carlos was saying, at the ground level for particularly rural communities where investment is actually often desperately needed. And that all of a sudden creates a very different mindset around what investment can look like. It's a little bit like the energy renewables concept. Once you flipped the switch into cost benefit for renewables, we're gonna see the same thing with providing the cost benefit of nature. That's why we need the pricing models, that's why we need these mechanisms, these positive incentive, but also driving consistent governance on these mechanisms so that we can really flip economies to create business opportunity and investment on the ground. Uh, Thomas, how do you see civil society um, being part of this and driving this forward? Well, I think that um, you know the example of Costa Rica is obviously outstanding. Um, and I would say it's particularly outstanding because there hasn't been a particular civil society push. It's been a governmental approach for you know multiple generations which I of course applaud and I wish it would be possible to mimic that in so many nations um, but as the minister just outlined the cases or the conditions for doing that in many places are not possible so I think the way to hack it if you want when you don't have um, a government uh, that is enlightened uh, is to try and um, distribute capacity by informing citizens of what are some of the relevant policies that might be enforceable in their uh, own geography, uh, be it regional, national, uh, city at the city scale, et cetera, or bioregional, um, and, um, and to sort of equip them with that sort of knowledge and to take part in activist actions that cripple uh, government's uh, current actions, especially when it concerns indirect or direct subsidies to, you know, uh, hurting or creating negative externalities in business in general. So I think that if you look at what Extinction Rebellion has been representing, uh, especially in the UK, uh, so I'm currently uh, um, producing a documentary about the founder, and not so much because I want to support Extinction Rebellion in itself, but I think it's important that we are looking at what are some of the tools that we have at our disposal when we cannot use the normal uh, legislation processes um, and we, we, we need to sort of uh, create a new process. Uh, so Extinction Rebellion is interesting in particular because of its theory of change. Uh, so Roger Hollum uh, you know, is a learned uh, academic and he was the co-founder and he really looked into how Gandhi, Mandela um, and uh, you know, Martin Luther King's techniques of non-violent civil disobedience can be instrumentalized you know, through, call it, uh, targeted incidents that you know, galvanize public opinion. Uh, and I think that that's, so we need to learn from history. And um, one way to look at this is to say that for a long time, we were only willing to, you know, let's say, put our life on the line for our civil liberties. But now the right to life being connected to biodiversity and pl planetary, you know, regeneration capacity, things have changed. And so that's my opinion about civil society. We need to give them the tools to think correctly, whether it's through the climate reality or other information tools that we might have. I think non-scientific is better. I think we should be, it's not about the facts anymore. I think we know that we're doing the wrong thing. Um, and we should be able to stop what, what is obviously poor for the planet. And then, you know, there are levels of graduation. You know, I think there's an obsession with data and science, which has been very important to prove, you know, the point against climate deniers. But I think we're past the, we're that. We're past that. We're past that, yeah. Yeah, so we need fast actions. Caroline, how, how I, do those I fast just, actions I want to, I just wanted to come in on, the, on this term market failure. Okay. It's one that we, we use. I actually think this isn't about market failure. I think this is about the fact that we have a skewed market. It's not that the, there's somehow some gap and the money can't reach or, or um, we can't support biodiversity. Is that the system is tilted to discourage any long-term investment. So, so how do you tilt it to... I think you tilt it back through regulation, 
by making companies integrate environmental, social governance factors and making that public, by disclosing, um, disclosing information so citizens and consumers can see who's investing one way, how products are made. But I think, I think the really important thing, and I think the first step should be that government policy has to change. We've talked a lot about um, business. I think that governments have to change in terms of subsidization. And what is interesting now is the first time I think you're seeing demand from young people, from millennials, from long-term investors, that now you see the business roundtable in the US, you see some governments realizing they will not stay in power and businesses will not meet their shareholder demands unless they change their fundamental models of the bottom line. And the bottom line in just short-term profit is not going to be enough anymore. Can you see? Um, can you see there are uh, um, some countries which are, which are which are doing brilliant work on this? I mean, we, we uh, we're, we're very pleased to be, be, to be joined by by um, Carlos Manuel. But are there other countries where you can sort of see these yeah these tipping points, these changes happening? I think I think there are, there are many uh, countries that are doing this. Whether they're moving away from uh, coal-fired generation or they're changing their agricultural policy. I see other countries that are doing less, perhaps at the federal level, but where the localities are very, very active. I think in the US, for example, the cities movement, and indeed the cities movement all around the world, are taking action. And I think that is a product of the fact that, that we now have much more citizen participation. And in the end, people will, will have to respond to that. But I think that, um, I really think we have to stand up there and talk about, and Davos has talked about this, a new form of stakeholder capitalism. And what that really means is that nature has to be a stakeholder as well as, as humans, as well as the physical environment, the economic environment, the social environment. We can't just think of our economies in the old way. Thomas, I'm going to come to you in just a sec, but um, we have a few minutes left. So, if there are any questions, we have. Um, could you have uh, have your have your questions ready, Tom Thomas? Very quickly, I'm, I just wanted to say how excited I am by what you just shared because stakeholder, um, you know, uh, led capitalism is something we probably can only perform today with the tools that we have. You know, the tools of the fourth industrial revolution, or however we, we decide to call them. So through you know blockchain, crypto, artificial intelligence, and a number of let's say uh, new uses of the way that we treat data, hopefully more ethically over time, I think there, there's a, there's a great opportunity. So we're, we're faced with one of the greatest challenges ever. At the same time, we do have the tools at our disposal, and I think the work, for example, of the Rocky Mountain Institution uh, Institute uh, that I, I helped as well. Um, and Amory Lovins or you know others who've been writing about natural capital for some time uh, is finally it's possible to perform that switch um, and I'm tremendously excited by that and I, I want people to at least feel that they can place hope that there are we have the instruments of change so you, you actually are optimistic I don't think I I, uh, I don't think it's about that I think I, I want to be optimistic <laughs> Um, we have a, we have a, um, we can uh, can get, come back to uh, other remarks from the from the panel, but we, I think we have a question here from. Yeah, um, I'm Kerry Thomas. I work for a, a media company called Tortoise, based in London. I, I I wanted to ask the panel specifically to address sort of real world live question, which is the Amazon rainforest. Given your concern, Caroline, about mispricing, and given what you said, Carlos Manuel, about um, the need for political engagement. Um, how, what sequence of things might start to price the Amazon rainforest correctly? Uh, and is that the first step? What's, what's the order of play that gets us into the right place on the rainforest? Well, I, I would really love to hear Carlos's response to that because he has to deal with these issues in, in real time. So let's, let's hear. So what, uh, what we saw this last year in the Amazon is what is happening all over the tropics. It's not just the Amazon. First point, it's happening in Sumatra, it's happening in Madagascar, it's happening in the Congo Basin countries, it's happening in, in Cambodia, it's happening in Mesoamerica, all over the place. And forest fires are used by humans to do land use change, to put land under production. 
even though the conditions of soils may not be suitable for large-scale farming and agriculture. Uh, and why, are, why is this happening? Because there is not an international market for carbon credits at all. That's the only option the owner of the land or the country does has. And uh, unless we agree on Article 6 on the Climate Convention, we will continue having global deforestations at the levels that we have them as, as of today. If we are unable within the Climate Convention to fully agree on the, how, how we will implement Article 6, the signs that we are sending to the private sector, particularly to the big agro business and to other um, as, um, other the sectors within the you know the business community is that you know business as usual is you know is there and they can continue doing that so um, that, that's one issue but it's not just the lack of agreement on Ar article 6 which is the main thing it's also the price for carbon forests uh, the, the few funds that can really mobilize resources for carbon payments are paying $5 a ton. And that is uh, an insult to any uh, nations with pride and decency. Uh, in Costa Rica, it costs us around $17 to $20 to generate a ton of carbon. And our carbon is high quality carbon. It's not like that, you know, regular carbon coming from three plantations with exotic species. The carbon that we generate in Costa Rica is good bank carbon associated to, to biodiversity conservation and human well-being. Nevertheless, they offer us $5 a ton. Why for $5 a ton from, from a high quality carbon generated in Costa Rica and somebody's paying $80 a ton for a cement plant in Switzerland? I don't get it. So if we don't fix that problem, we will have a major pro situation because without the carbon forests of the tropical countries, we will never ever achieve the 1.5 degree. And global deforestation is happening, as you saw it probably this year, where you know forest fires increase more than 80 percent in the Amazon country basin. So we need to deal with these issues at the same time that. Um, good governance, particularly on the environment and forest sector is extremely important. We keep on having big issues on how we manage natural resources from the government perspective. We divide governments and agencies within renewable and non-renewable natural resources. Uh, in Costa Rica, I'm the Minister of Energy and Environment. I don't have a Minister of Energy to fight with. We are, we are able to really set landscape policies and that has helped us a lot and, and please don't don't get the wrong impression Costa Rica is not the example we got a mess we got a huge mess in our country pollution is crazy transportation very inefficient but we've been investing in the institutional governance part of it and we will solve this problem in 10 to 15 years but again my 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 point here is you need to really invest in what I will simplify as a good governance. Uh, Thomas, uh, yeah, if you make, make your quick. just remarks very brief, because yeah. we, we have one more question. It's on the same same kind of vein. Um, so uh, I fully agree with um, with Minister here uh, about the the need for a fair carbon pricing um, as it being essential. However, I think there's no silver bullet as to how we're going to deal with the Amazon, and um, I think it's important for us to speed up piloting of new in types of initiatives that leverage the fourth industrial revolution tools uh, and in particular i think if we can set a price on land um, using cryptocurrencies um, and in general blockchain processes for fundraising and crowdsourcing um, you know donations from around the world i think we, we can speed up the process to empower indigenous communities to defend their soil because it's really a it's not just the price of carbon, it's that it's the livelihoods that are attached that motivate them to do the wrong thing or to give in. So I think we, uh, indigenous groups to me are the number one vector of change in the Amazon and in, in most of the uh, uh, endangered forests because they, they hold the keys to steward the forest. They've done it for a long time and, um, and it also links up with human, uh, human rights and decency. Um, so I sit here on the Council for Human Rights and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So I, there's a deep link here, and I think 
decorrelating those issues is, is the wrong approach. And also really testing things quickly that are currently not being done uh, at a not national scale, but rather sub-regional scale where you have, for example, the mayors that can push for this rather than um, national governments. That's my uh, opinion. Okay. Uh, last, last question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Max. Uh, this is not a question, really. It's more of an observation. Uh, I come from Singapore and I work for the Straits Times. Uh, um, one of the things, uh, you know, uh, taking, taking up from what you said about uh, vectors of change, uh, I, I find the millennials uh, as huge vectors of change. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our big commodity companies based in Singapore is Olam International. Uh, you, you'd know that company very well. He's our chair, absolutely. He's your chair. Uh, so your chair, uh, Sunny Verghese, tells me that a lot of his thinking on sustainability was driven by what his children told him. Dad, you have an opportunity to do something about it. So I, I think if we bring the millennials into the debate, uh, from the ground up, we'll have pressures building on companies to do the right thing. Observation. Thank you. So should we almost turn that into a question and say, how would you bring? Okay. I mean, if we could, if I could have. Just very, to say, very extension quick rebellion is mainly is very millennial related, and okay. also the sunshine movement. So absolutely, I think that was part of the civil society question I asked. I, I think the millennials are already very involved. And um, I see it on the business side. Businesses and banks are rushing to get into impact investing uh, because millennials want to make sure their investing has purpose. And I think companies are finding now that as a part of a recruiting deal, they have to be able to offer purpose. Uh, they cannot attract, in the war for talent, they cannot attract the talent unless they stand for something beyond their bottom line. So I think we're seeing this pressure uh, from the bottom up coming, and I, I, I celebrate it, I rejoice at it, it's, it's timely, and we, we have to ride that wave now and, and take that opportunity. Diane? As Caroline just referenced, millennials are recognizing their power in the workforce. And I think, equal, like we're seeing in civil society, they are even in larger numbers in companies. And what Sonny has also shared is that, yes, while much of his awakening came from his children, what he's really hearing loud and clear is from his own employee base. We see that across all of our company members. That's where we're going to see huge drives, both with what it takes to create solutions within the business, because they're starting to move into the types of managerial positions where they can have impact with their voice, but equally through their expectations on where they choose to put their time when they go to work. Carlos, Carlos Manuel, very brief. Well, I, I will say that um, not, not just millennials should be putting a pressure to the, com the companies as sure. you know consumers. They should engage in politics very, very quickly. I, I mean, the, the <laughs> otherwise uh, there won't be any planet left to them, they need to understand that they are not just consumers. They got a political responsibility. And they need to step up and begin positioning the environmental issues within the political discourse, campaigns, plans, and operations. And that is not happening. If I want to run a, for president in Costa Rica just on climate change, I won't make it. Probably will have you know 1% of the votes. So we got an issue there as well. They, we need them to be, you know, politically responsible, step in, and do their political career as well. It's Thank you. That in your country, we we have to we have to stop there. But thank you, thank you very much.